Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, remember to subscribe, share, and support. You may subscribe wherever it is you are hearing my voice on the interwebs. You may share the very words of God you hear read aloud and recited, and also the link to wherever you found this. And you may support at patreon.com slash aksum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. My deep apologies for the sporadic nature of the podcast. It, for those of you who follow week to week, it's been a while, and that is because of more culminating wedding festivities, which seem to never end. People tell me that I'm basically a bridegroom for a year. It's been about four months. And while it's been a pleasure, I hope I've completed those duties to the bride and to both of our families. We are continuing through the majestic scroll of Romans, Paul's assault upon the good people of Rome or Babylon, as Peter calls it. And we are more than halfway done. So let's get through this text and let's get through the next few chapters to make sure we conclude and move on to the scripture so that we can hear again and again the life-giving words of God. We're reading from the King James Version not because it's a special version guided by the Holy Spirit, but because it's a special version that's in the public domain. Here we are in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The beginning here is very impressive. First of all, you have that great God forbid, which I hope you use when you speak English to recall scripture, whether people know it or not, to the minds of people. Second of all, the Israelite, which we'll cover again, is a contender, a jujitsu player, a grappler with El, with God. The seed, the common Semitic word zar, is uh, a word used for sperm, but also to connotate the will of humankind, the will of man, expressed, of course, through sex or copulation but also in many other ways that are functionally like that. Abraham comes from Eber, the one who crosses or who crosses over. The sojourner, which is fundamentally all of us in Scripture, if we take Scripture seriously. And finally, he's from the ben Jamin or Ben-Yamin, the Yaman in Hebrew and in Ge'ez, is the right the right hand, which connotates the power, the ability to caress, and the ability to have a technical knockout, as decided by the referee 
or simply a knockout, in which case you don't need a referee. Destruction and healing. So all of these images, the seed of the sojourner, the tribe of the powerful, those who contend or grapple or do jujitsu with God, these are all identity markers of the Judaism through which is the background of the Apostle Paul. And all of this, he's telling them, is not rejected from God's plan. Rather, others, especially capital O, others, and outsiders, and the remnant are added and mingled into the fold. You don't like that? Tough luck. Take that up with the big guy upstairs. Verses 7 to 12. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded? According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Again, another great passage here. And here we realize that eyes and ears are functional. Whether we're talking about statues or flesh. When I say statues, you could think of the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, if you're a proud American. Or if you grew up on Saturday morning cartoons like me, you could think of gargoyles. If racism is on your mind, you could think of lawn jockeys. Whatever it is, if you're in the original context of Scripture, you think of the many idols of the many gods, deities, demons, is what they are. And they all have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. And that's kind of an obvious fact. What's less obvious is that we as flesh bags, as meat bags here, as sojourners and guests on the earth, also have the same potentiality to have our functionality taken away. If we are not serving the Lord, we are no different than these statues. This is the critique of the Psalms, of Isaiah and Deuteronomy as listed here by Paul. This table is a snare and a trap. It reminds me of Corinthians, and we'll get to it, where you're either eating at the table of the Lord or at the table of demons. There is no in-between. You either have the table fellowship or you don't. You have this communion, this sharing, this participation, or you don't. And you should know by your fruits. This is a, a type that we see in the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones for you TV and film buffs out there. You prepare a table for your guests and you're slaughtered at the very table that you present in your bid for hospitality. This is how some of those people may have felt by the inclusion of the Gentiles. It may seem like it cheapens the value of the chosenness or being the chosen people of God. It may feel to them like when Federal Reserve notes are printed by the printing press, which is now, of course, digital, and it debases the monetary supply. But that's not how God's grace works. God's grace cannot be debased. And so it's the wrong way of looking at it. So the Gentiles' inclusion doesn't exclude the original Israel. Rather, the larger Israel is both of these people 
who are included in all of humanity, all of Adam, all of the groundling, and all of Eve, or all of life, or the living one. And there is greater greatness in both of these groups submitting unto the Lord. Verses 13 through 24. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide, not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted, contrary to nature, into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree humankind has been weakened by the so-called democracies and oligarchies of the past 200 to 250 years and in that time what they've gotten is a sort of mild sauce the goldilocks of the bernstein bears not too cold not too hot it's just right this sort of medium lukewarmness and we've covered the scroll of revelation on this podcast so go back and listen to it if you've forgotten but the lukewarm will get spit out you see god is much like the empires of old and is like my little explanation for benjamin or benjamin the son of the right or the son of the right hand or the son of power it's that the hand could be used to caress and massage, or to strike and destroy. There is a functionality, there is a looseness in the ability of someone who is sovereign over you to do with you whatever you want. And here, it's expressed in the dichotomy or the binary of natural branches and those grafted in, which are of course stand-ins for the older Israel and the newer Israel, which are the Gentiles. And here's the thing that nobody likes. God, as the true king, does whatever he wants with the natural branches and whatever he wants with those grafted in. If the natural branches stop their lack of trust and gain a lack of trust, they'll be in good shape. If those grafted in stop trusting, they won't be in good shape. So the key is to trust him, to be loyal to him. Use the new Ethiopian New Year, around which time I'm recording this, entering into 2014, 
in the era of Saint Mark. Use this Rasa Audamet. Use this Rosh Hashanah for the Hebrew New Year. The cousin of Gaz, of course, as a time to renew your trust and your loyalty with Him. And again, not with vain talk, but through your actions, through your deeds, through your way of life. Verses 25 through the end. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. This mystery that the Apostle Paul speaks of is not the mystery of the magic of Houdini or of Alexander, the man who knows, or any other vaudeville villains who serve for your entertainment. Instead, this is the revealed truth of God in a particular context of human history, of human space and time, but really it's God's space and God's time because the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof belong to him, including all of Israel, which is to say all of humanity that God wills it to be. So live your life from him through him and to him. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us.